You can do it whenever you want. Okay, then, yeah, maybe it's ready 5 p.m. here in Würzburg at least. <laughs> so, yeah, let's start out right in time. So, yeah, welcome to the CMR Journal Club, um, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Um, I think we have two very interesting and clinically highly relevant papers today, um, which both focus on the yeah, security aspects um, of cardiac MR and uh, who cover different, smaller different aspects. Uh, one is covering um, the leads um, of um, ICDs and uh, pacemakers and the other one, um, epicardial uh, leads. So quite some differences, but both very interesting. And um, for clinical day-to-day -day, day work, something we encounter quite often as a problem. So might be very interesting. So Anish Buva joined us from London. Welcome. And um, he will start out with, with the first paper, um, which is, yeah presented already. So maybe I don't have to repeat the title. <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you very much, Bettina. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's really nice to, to be able to talk about this paper, which was a lot of hard work. I'd say about five years hard work from, from a really big team of us to get this together. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go through the paper. I've, I've planned it about for five, 10 minutes, Bettina, but please point me in the right direction and, and then we can take questions afterwards. So um, we titled this work um, ra in, a, in a proactive sense. So we provided our interpretation and rather than saying evidence um, of risk, we, we thought the evidence supported um, MR conditional labeling of all pacemaker and defibrillator leads in patients with cardiac implantable electronic devices. Um, and, and the inspiration for this really was that whilst we know it's technically possible to perform MR for patients who have MR conditional, or at least as they're now called in the UK, MR unlabeled devices rather than non-MR conditional or other terminology. So those devices and combinations that haven't been tested in an MR environment, um, it's still really hard to do. So if you have a patient who has a fully MR conditional system, the logistical hurdles to accessing MRI, whether it's for the heart or other parts of the body, um, is really a lot higher if that device hasn't been tested. And I think uh, since 2008, when MR conditional devices have been around, since the, the large New England Journal studies in 2017, 2018, um, and subsequent um, changes to funding arrangements, uh, at least in, in the US, I think there's a shift now to, to performing more MR uh, in, a, in, in an off-label fashion. But what that leads to is, is one, the logistics of it, two, having the clinical governance. If you haven't, ha have, you haven't got, if you've got a system which hasn't been tested in MR environment, but there's a high clinical gain, the patient needs a cancer or stroke diagnosis. Um, before we embarked on this work, at least from, from the data for about two, 3,000 scans, I think um, the Shah um, et al. meta-analysis in heart rhythm um, summarized a lot of it very nicely, suggested that most of the, um, the clinical um, safety endpoints were related to the generator rather than the leads. And the MR conditional design of leads from 2008, manufacturers put in a lot of effort to, to change their lead design. Um, to make it more MR conditional with different structures of the conducting filaments and insulation um, that had a knock-on effect on, on safety in part. And, and of course, now leads are being retrospectively labeled as, um, as MR conditional. So all of that came together to suggest that actually the leads weren't the issue. And at least in our population here in the UK, we see it fairly regularly where you've got a generator, which is from one manufacturer, the leads are from another for various, many, many reasons why that would be the case. Um, and so we, we, our aim for this paper was to look at the evidence for any signal of increased risk in patients who've got MR conditional leads versus leads which are not MR conditional. 
Um, and for, for MR, not MR conditional, I guess I now I use the term MR and label partly because that's what uh, is recommended in the UK. But I'll, I'll try and be consistent through that. Um, but people use other terms such as MR non conditional, MR conditional um, at the same time. And so this is really hard to do um, because it meant looking through each device and classifying whether each component uh, had had previously received MR conditional labeling or not. But of course, that's remember system specific and, and component specific. And so we, we had to look at this in a number of ways to really try and be confident um, with our interpretation. And so we, we initially started by looking at data from our own centre here in London. So that's Bart's Heart Centre, um, the Royal Brompton Hospital, which is on the other side of London. Um, and both of these are, are large centres that perform probably about 400 um, scans for pe people with pacemakers and defibrillators every year. Um, and then we combined this with um, a centre in the United States run by Harold Litt um, and University of Pennsylvania who have been, who've been doing thousands of these scans far before we'd, we'd really started any, any tangible service here. And, and they, they've mentored us over the few years as we've grown as well. And so we combined the data uh, from our clinical scans. So these, all the scans were performed for clinical indications across these three sites. Um, and, and we looked at the data for MR conditional devices and those devices which were uh, MR unlabeled. At least the data in the UK was prospectively assembled. So we, we created al almost a registry uh, from, from the studies and, and, monitor and, and recorded lead parameters as we went along. And the data from America was only for non-MR conditional devices, largely because that's the, the nature of the funding system. Um, and, we, and we looked at about, um, we, that data was collected retrospectively. Um, but we were able to do this partly because our protocols were very similar. Um, our scanners were very similar. And so that meant there wasn't much bias between the scans, um, regardless of the body type and the, um, and the type of device that was coming through whichever the site. And so the protocol we followed is, I, I think it's reasonable to say it's fairly similar to published guidelines. But I do want to highlight one aspect that I think we'll see more and more of, which is the identification of high risk scenarios before scanning. And by high risk scenarios, I'm referring to all MR, MR unlabeled devices, but the high risk scenarios were regarded as fractured leads, epicardial leads, abandoned leads, or devices such as at the ERI. And there had to be an obvious uh, benefit risk discussion, a clear indication that it would change, uh, potentially change clinical management. There's no other imaging modality for these scans. And so the patients were all, all consented prior to undergoing MRI. If they had an MR conditional labeling, we followed manufacturer, um, manufacturer conditions uh, for the duration of the scan. But actually, all our centers, as we've, we've become used to scanning off-label in off-label situations, we, we all perform scans, um, say, off of a device, an MR conditional device, where the ISO center has not been tested. We all feel comfortable performing those scans in an off-label fashion with the right monitoring. So if, say, a, a device has been tested from the, the eyes to the hip, but they need a, a brain scan that, that would have been performed in our centers. Um, and that was classified as an MR conditional um, uh, device and scan. Standard safety procedures during the scan, which I won't go into, and all devices were interrogated afterwards. And the follow-up was arranged as per the institution. And usually this was about one to two months follow-up in the device clinic. But of course, if there were significant changes in lead parameters, these were, these were monitored um, earlier. Um, depending on the on the clinician discretion, so the protocol for MRI itself was was very strict, simple, restricting to normal operating mode. All our MRI scanners were Siemens uh, one point five Tesla scans, and the imaging protocol varied on the clinical indication and the body part. But all were needed. Uh, all were clinical protocols here. Um, afterwards, we. We monitored the device and recorded lead parameters as well as battery. Um, and I think the important thing there is that the, one has to accept that there are fluctuations in lead parameters, even when you measure them day to day. So it's really difficult to define what is one, what is significant, and two, what is abnormal before and after MRI. So the, the, we informed that decision partly by looking at the data uh, 
in its entirety rather than um, ad, um, introducing uh, artificial or arbitrary cutoffs. But we also took predefined thresholds and we made sure they were predefined um, largely from one of the pilot studies from the MagnaSafe, where they looked at about 30 patients, essentially with um, test retest of lead parameters to see how much normal fluctuation was. So that was fairly helpful, but of course, there were some patients who would fall out of those test retest variability um, in, in normal day-to-day normal, um, um, -day variation rather than related to the MRI scans. And then we've got um, the, the variability between MRR conditional devices pre and post MRI compared to the variability in MRR labeled devices pre and post MRI. So we looked at that as well. And really what we wanted to look at on top of lead parameters as a surrogate were the, the primary clinical safety endpoints. So we wanted to answer whether there were any clinical safety events, death, lead failure, um, arrhythmia, or, or generator malfunction or electrical reset off the device or any other um, um, event leading to patient harm. And so we monitored uh, for all of those and, and we did that until the point of follow-up. So again, for about two, three months afterwards. And as I've said before, the, the hard bit really was that we labeled each individual device component for all our patients um, as MR conditional or not. So it wasn't, this, it was partly the system in its entirety, but also looking at each component. And that allowed us to answer the question whether the actual labeling itself off leads um, added incremental risk or at least detectable uh, risk within this registry setting. Um, so out of, from the three centers, there were about 1,100 MRI scans performed. Um, because of the nature, all our centers are large cardiac centers, uh, about 40% were cardiac MRI scans. Uh, and, and I think consistent with clinical experience and other registry data, a number of patients had repeat scans. So I think we had um, up to about 20 to 30 MRI scans on an individual patient um, as part of this cohort. We, um, I think we were pretty good, considering this is mostly um, clinical data that we didn't, we, we, we didn't record, lead parameters weren't recorded in the 99 examinations, but there were no significant changes within all of those. Um, the, I'll go to the baseline table. Then. So you've got, and we stratified by MR conditional system. Remember, we're looking at lead conditionality, but this is uh, the baseline table split by system. Uh, and the reason lead condition is conditionality is important because in your non-MR conditional systems, you will have some MR conditional leads and pulse generators. So about 20% had an MR conditional pulse generator in the non-MR conditional systems. Unsurprisingly, patients who had uh, MR uh, label systems were older, they had um, leads which were older, um, and their devices were slightly different, so more, more likely to be, to be defibrillators rather than pacemakers. The type of scans also varied. There were more spines and, and MR heads in the MR label group. I think that partly represents the threshold to scan. Um, again, as I've said, it's for cancer and strokes where you um, there's there's a higher clinical need, so they found their way to the MRI scanner in those, in those patients um, rather than for the MR conditional systems where um, these are um, more likely to be referred for the standard clinical indications. We've also split the lead characteristics by um, MR conditional labeling as well, which you can find out at the bottom. Um, and the one thing I wanted to highlight here was that there were a number of patients in the MR label group who had leads that were greater than 10 years old, so that, um, which is quite a lot. And, and that, the reason for mentioning that is because the number of um, in vitro studies that, that have suggested the older lead designs have increased heating in an MR environment. But of course, the in vitro studies have um, have MR experiments that are really pushing to try and heat the leads, not not performed, not really comparable to um, scans performed in the clinical environment, generally speaking. So, what did we find? Um, we so we found. I'll start with the clinical safety events. So, no deaths or lead failures. No um, complete, complete or partial electrical resets and there were no inappropriate defibrillator therapies or inhibition of pacing. So that was very reassuring. The, there were two safety events, I think, that are worth mentioning. They're both in, in patients with non-MR conditional devices. 
So one patient had a dual chamber ICD and had a known advisory to that generator and to the battery. Um, and a week after the MRI scan, there was a fault code because the battery estimate was felt to be inaccurate. Um, that's it's how it's known. It's a known fault for that generator, so it was unclear whether it was related to MRI. But we did class it as such. Um, a second patient who had a completely inactive system. So this is a device which was implanted in 1999. So about almost 20 years old by the time they got to the MRI scanner. They required an MRI off, I believe off a limb and the device is redundant and inactive. But when they were, the patient went into the MRI scanner, they developed a, what appeared to be a broad complex tachycardia with symptoms. And this resolved as soon as the patient was removed from the MR environment. Bearing in mind, again, this was prior to any sequences actually, actually running for that scan. So because it was quite unusual the, and the scan was felt um, to have a strong clinical indication, the scan was reattempted, but actually with a, with the, a similar sequence. Have you got some um, and so at that point, we, yeah, felt sure, we just abandoned the scan. The so patients with MRI Sorry, Anish, sorry to, to interrupt you. Um, maybe you can wrap up a bit um, so that we have um, still some sure. time left for discussion because we are already over the 15 minutes. Ah, thanks. thanks, thanks for being <laughs> sorry about that. So I'll go to the graphs because I think they tell the story well. So this is looking at the change in all the lead parameters um, when pre and post MRI, where red is the MR label group, green is the MR conditioning group. And you can see the graphs are really quite similar. So there's no convincing signal that a subclinical endpoints, potentially more sensitive of myocardial heating or lead damage itself, um, suggests that there's, there was any difference um, in that group. So Bettina, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up there. And I'll just finish by saying, we looked at the data in a number of different ways. We looked at MR conditional leads versus non-MR conditional leads. We looked at ICDs versus pacemakers, again, for the same groups. Uh, we looked at lead age and a number of other variables. And really the take home message was that the, the variance in lead parameters wasn't particularly large peri-MRI. There weren't any significant lead parameter changes that necessitated a change to the clinical management of the patient. And all those changes were very similar, regardless of whether the lead was labeled as MR unlabeled or MR conditional. Okay, thank you very much. Um, really interesting study. Um, so so um, please put your questions uh, in the chat if you have some. Um, so how, how do you deal clinically with these results? Do you care about leads of which origin <laughs> ever or uh, so did this this study have any implications on your personal clinical care and we can send all our patients who've got uh, mr enabled devices prior to mri but now what we're doing is those patients who've got an mr conditional generator can, uh, to attach to mr unlabeled leads we treat them as an MR conditional scan. So we still have strict workflows, but the consent process is verbal and not, um, not written. Um, so that lowers the barrier to scanning. And as our general radiology become more familiar with it, with these scans and so performing them in general radiology rather than our cardiac scanners and on our sister network sites, uh, these are the first um, cohort of patients we will be happy to form in the other centers. So it's about lowering barriers to MRI. Yeah, that's has might have really huge clinical implications, I guess. So did it, did you already uh, try it in, in cardiac scans as well? I didn't. Maybe I didn't get this, but we, uh, these so we, were all body regions uh, which it, were scanned. These were all body regions, um, but about forty percent were cardiac scans. Okay. There wasn't there wasn't much of a signal difference between those who had a cardiac ISIS center versus extra cardiac ISIS centers. Okay, very interesting. Okay, so uh, thank you very much again. In the interest of time, I think we'll move on um, to the next presentation. Maybe you can unshare your screen. Um, and there we go.
Great, then Dietrich might share his screen. <laughs> so um, thanks again for coming, Anish. If you have to leave <laughs> um, earlier, then um, yeah, great study, really interesting. Thank you so um, much, my pleasure. Yeah, so uh, the next uh, paper will be presented um, by Dietrich Beitzke, who is from Vienna. And um, this covers another um, type of leads, I'd say, um, <laughs> namely retained epicardial pacing wires, um, which have left our leftovers uh, after heart transplantation. So thanks for joining Dietrich and uh, the stage is yours. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, can you see my screen? Does it work? Yes, perfect. perfect. Okay. So actually, um, we never wanted to do this analysis. We sort of were forced by the surgeons to do this analysis. Uh, this is a subgroup analysis, one ongoing cohort study. And as the um, Department of Cardiac Surgery suddenly decided to leave the, uh, the, the epicardial pacemaker wires that are routinely inserted after operation in the patients, uh, we had a problem with our ongoing study, and then we had to do this uh, analysis in order to, to, to look at safety issues uh, to move on with this cohort study. So these are my disclosures. So the background for this analysis was the patients after transplant, they do have often metallic remnants, either from assist devices, old pacemaker, ICD leads, and, uh, and so on, and therefore access to MR is generally hindered and that this population needs MR in the, in the future follow-up. Um, so the aim was to evaluate, uh, um, as I said, um, I'm not, not, uh, it was not a planned study, to evaluate safety and image quality of these CMR scans that we did in the cohort study with these retained pacing wires. Uh, and uh, it was an, an issue and it's also an issue because all our, uh, our children that undergo cardiac surgery and also have these uh, pacemaker wire remnants in there. So we wanted also to create further uh, scientific uh, evidence from this field. So that's how these pacemaker wires look like. Uh, these are uh, uh, temporary wires that are inserted by this needle and that, that is the, the anchor body. And this anchor body is here uh, located most of, in most of the patients at the RV uh, and at the right atrium. So these are uh, two binds. And then uh, these, uh, um, um, these wires are, are just, just left in, in, the, uh, uh, in the epicardium and uh, they leave uh, via a subcutaneous uh, lead out to the outside monitor uh, in order to pace the, the newly uh, transplanted heart uh, from rapid pacing and then down. And after three weeks, they, they, uh, um, they are, uh, depending, on the, depending on the clinical situations, they are torn usually. Uh, sometimes these, uh, um, uh, these uh, wires are left in also in, a, in, in routine because at the time point of the, of, uh, of the, uh, when they try to remove that, there is too much pressure on it or there is a suture due to bleeding at the operation site. Therefore, they leave these uh, wires in and they cut it at the subcutaneous level. So what are the potential uh, uh, interaction between uh, these wires and an MR system? So of course, gradient and RF field, uh, they might induce heating and voltage induction. And this is what we are afraid of because this might cause arrhythmia. The static field with these uh, forces and torque from the static field is not a relevant issue because these wires are very thin and they are not ferromagnetic. So what was known before we started with this, uh, with this uh, analysis or before we went on with our uh, cohort studies, we knew from the manufacturer that these wires are non-ferromagnetic. We knew from fo um, former studies that in vitro there was no heating uh, in an MR experiment. Ex vivo with uh, 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 explanted pig parts, there was no heating and no thermal damage in histology uh, could be shown. It's a very important uh, German work from Jena. And in some retrospective analysis, it has been shown that nothing happens overall. So most of these, uh, um, um, these uh, case reports and case series reported 
uh, on uh, 1.5 Tesla non-cardiac MR scans. Uh, uh, however, due to the very thin evidence that it that is published uh, in uh, um, in an analysis uh, in done in New Zealand and in Australia, so nearly 90% of the MR institution rejected this patient, and uh, that's 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 an impact on the patient because if you're rejected from uh, uh, having an MR for your lifetime uh, and you switch to CT or something else, this has an impact on your clinical, uh, might have an impact on your uh, further clinical course. Uh, another problem that we witness in clinical routine is that you don't see these wires or you hardly see these wires here in, in, in chest X-ray. So they are also not reported in chest, chest X-ray. You see them on uh, CT, of course, and you see that they might present with different forms. Yeah? This is sort of a C-shaped form, that we call it a C-shaped form. And this is a, a wire that has some an antenna. And you don't want, actually, you don't want to have this in your uh, MR uh, because this is uh, what takes the energy and puts it toward uh, uh, the RV or towards the subcutaneous insertion point. So as I already mentioned, study setting was a subgroup analysis of our uh, ongoing um, um, uh, study cohort of uh, 100 patients uh, that underwent CMR at three months, one, two, three, four, five years after cardiac transplant. This study is still ongoing. Hopefully we will going to publish first results soon. And, soon. and we identified 19 patients with re uh, retained wires. And these 19 patients, they underwent uh, overall 51 CMR scans. And even five patients had four, six patients had three, and five patients had two examinations. Um, we used the standard protocol at uh, uh, 1.5. It was a, it is, well, it is a standard protocol for myocardial inflammation, including a, a late, late GAD, including mapping, a stir sequence, uh, and of course, uh, CNA imaging for cardiac function. Um, the retained wire, they, as I already mentioned, they had different lab forms. It was looped, C-shaped, straight. Uh, and then we also looked at, of course, events. Events were uh, defined as uh, adverse events, so harmful events, arrhythmia, self-reported heating, burnings, severe uh, pain during the scan. Unfortunately, no one uh, reported these uh, uh, symptoms. And uh, mild events defined as any other events that were potentially associated to MR uh, uh, interaction. And there we detected one mild event. It was a, we call it a sensory event. Someone we felt at, at an insertion point of the, of the lead subcutaneously, uh, some feeling. It was not a heating, it was a, a sensory event. Um, this happened due to the second scan within the study and it happened during the first sequence, during the haste sequence. Um, when we switched off the sequence or stopped the sequence, uh, uh, it disappeared. When we uh, started the sequence again, it reappeared. Therefore, it was uh, defined as a being MR associated. Uh, this patient dropped out of, of the study but had no uh, clinically relevant uh, further events. Um, Image quality is also uh, an important point when, when we have uh, metallic remnants uh, in these patients. Uh, and this is something we also an analyzed. And as you will see in the next slide, uh, this is not a really relevant topic. You see that uh, uh, none of these uh, sequences were uh, impaired in any form. Uh, therefore, the, um, uh, the image quality was uh, not impaired overall. So this is a uh, 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 um, clinical example, you see the, um, the wires here in front of the RV groove on the right, right side here in front of the RV. So sometimes it's very hard to, to find the, the artifacts uh, uh, that are caused by these very small wires. And therefore uh, you often, you would, not, you would not recognize them uh, during scanning if you don't know them and if you, if you uh, don't look at this uh, at this corner, especially as sometimes you uh, might forget on the RV when dealing with myocardial inflammation or, or rejection. So that's what what these artifacts look like. So no impact on quality. So uh, limitations of our study. 
Of course, we are reusing only cardiac scans. Some of the patients underwent uh, also other, some other scans, but we excluded them from the analysis because then it would not be a, a, a homogeneous cohort. So uh, results uh, from our study are really not uh, only valid for 1.5 Tesla. It's not for 3 Tesla, but however, uh, field strength doesn't make a difference here. Um, and it's not uh, uh, valid for other in our procedures that are, are, are deal with higher energy deposition, like uh, extensive liver scanning, for example, or, or doing a, a, um, a scan of the thoracic aperture with uh, DTI or something like that. Uh, therefore, that's, of course, a limitation. So in conclusion, cardiac MR at 1.5 Tesla with these retained wires appears to be safe, and uh, these patients should not be excluded from the scanning. And uh, as a, a good show, uh, image quality is uh, preserved in these patients. So uh, with, with, with this, we uh, tried to create further evidence. And now we put all of these patients with wires in, also the children. Uh, and uh, I think we've done, uh, since the publication, we've done another 50 or 70 scans more with these remnants. And overall, nothing happens. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, concise summary of your work. I think as, as the paper presented before, this is clinically really highly relevant um, because I personally can remember uh, quite a couple of yeah. patients who were rejected due to some uh, unclear I, I, leads placed wherever. <laughs> uh, I, I get a lot of I get a lot of questions on, on this on these papers uh, on this paper. And uh, also the company that produces the wire is, is uh, very, very grateful for, for, for evidence. Uh, and they collect this evidence and they show this evidence uh, to uh, uh, radiologists, especially radiologists that are afraid of uh, metallic remnants. And there are a lot of mycologists that are afraid of this. Yeah, I, I can imagine. So uh, sometimes, Studies like this were not intended initially. <laughs> no, we're going to show not. quite an interesting results. <laughs> yeah. So any any questions from the floor? Um, so I didn't see any. Please put them in the chat if you have some. Um, so do you uh, plan to to also um, maybe in the future do some studies for other body regions because it would be quite interesting. There is even a higher number of studies performed uh, on liver and uh, and other body regions or isn't this in your personal focus so as i only do cardiac and cardiovascular Im imaging um, I, I cannot do these studies i try to convince my colleagues uh, <laughs> uh, to do that however uh, these patients often undergo uh, 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 mr uh, because it's not known that there are remnants in there mm. that's also also a, a problem Maybe we should just wait um, for another five years and then try to collect uh, this patient. However, when I'm, I'm asked, uh, I always look at the scan that is performed. If you do a, a liver scan, a normal liver scan, uh, it, it should not be a problem. However, if you do a, a liver scan for study purposes with a lot of diffusion or something mm. like that, that might be that might be a problem. But I think it's not a problem for routine, especially not for emergency protocols like for stroke or something like that. And there is already prospective data on that uh, published by by uh, in 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 the lit in the literature. Mm -hmm. Even with uncut wires. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. So I'll take your paper as a reference for the future, <laughs> for sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay. If there are no questions left, um, I'd like to thank uh, both presenters again for the excellent presentations and the, the great work um, for further evidence in, in safety of uh, cardiac and other MR. Um, and Matthias wants to give an overview of the next SEMA uh, journal club. Uh, should I show the slide, Matthias? Yeah, so, or, yeah, okay. so can uh, Dietrich, maybe you can unshare your screen. Yes. Um, Okay, so and uh, Bettina, if, I don't know whether you could share the slide. Do you have that? So yeah, next, I have it. Next next month, so in June. Sorry, I'm in, in a on a plane.
uh, but not flying. <laughs> so not yet. <laughs> so next next uh, month it will be about synthetic CMR parameters, which is very interesting. So replacing contrast enhanced or the need for um, blood tests. Uh, to still get images that look like they would uh, be acquired by regular sequences. So there are two papers. One is on synthetic ECV, um, and uh, um, that, that's from uh, Sebastian Kellis team from Berlin. And the other one is uh, about the quality and accuracy of T1 mapping based synthetic uh, late GAD. We had already presented a paper last year from Oxford, and this one is from South Korea. So, uh, very interesting new studies on using synthetic schema parameters. So, I hope to uh, see you all on June 1st. Thanks, Bettina. Back to you. Thank you, Matthias. Have a good flight. Um, so, I'm really looking forward to. The next CIMA Journal Club. These are very interesting papers, I, I think. So hope to see you all again. Have a nice evening and uh, stay safe. Bye bye.